primarily a session for novices. It's answering Pope Francis's call to the people of God to consider this uh, idea of a universal basic income. So the we this webinar has been organized really for that purpose, for us to consider and explore the UBI. And um, we need to therefore start with understanding a bit about what it is. Uh, and that's why we're going to have uh, uh, Michael Pugh tell us, and then we're going to get some comments. But what I want to do is begin with um, why I think the Pope uh, has asked us to consider this. And I just want to say in a as a proviso that even though this is all sparked by uh, Francis's remarks in the book that we co-wrote, it's his book, but I kind of helped him put it in together, called Let Us Dream, uh, um, that, uh, that uh, I obviously had some changes with him about this for the book, but really I can't tell you more about what he thinks based on the book than what is in the book. So what you're going to get here is my opinion as a commentator, uh, as his biographer, uh, and um, about why I think he's making this call. Now, as you know, last year, and I've put this in the, at the beginning of the chat, I've put the link, he wrote a letter to the popular movements in April last year in lockdown, in which he said this may be time to consider a universal wage. And he used the term salario universal in Spanish, universal wage, which he said would acknowledge and dignify the essential tasks that you carry out, addressing here the informal workers, which generated the usual discussion about what did the Pope mean and, you know, is salario and how does that translate and is he talking about what we would call uh, the UBI. And there were various comments made and important comments made. But that's all a little bit of the backstory. When we came to put Letters Dream together, you know, I asked him, I, I said, Go, let's be clear about this. What are we talking about? Is it the, what is in Spanish, the ingreso basico universal, or what we call in English nowadays, the universal basic income? And, you know, it's clear that he, that he was, and that's what's in the book. So there's no doubt that he is referring here to, uh, a, an unconditional flat cash payment to all citizens or all members of the group which is organizing this. Um, and then an income, if you like, uh, and then uh, levied from the, and then people pay tax on the first cent or penny that they earn above that. Now it's universal because it's unconditional. It goes to everyone within that defined unit independently of who they are or, or what they earn. In other words, it's a bit like in Britain, our entitlement to health on the National Health Service. It's unconditional. Uh, no qualifications are needed, but it's regular, it's secure, it's direct, it's permanent, a bit like indeed our NHS entitlement. It's called basic because, and here there's a lot of discussion, which I wanna try and avoid tonight because we're sticking with the general principles, but obviously the question of level and how much is a, is a question of big debate. But imagine that it's basic in the sense that we're really talking here about sustenance. So in the UK, we're probably talking about somewhere between 500 and 1000 pounds a month, uh, which I understand at the lower level wouldn't result in an over in an increased tax burden, but that's for the experts. And it is an income uh, and uh, and that's important. So th that's what the Pope is talking about. Now, th this idea, as many of you know, has been around for a very long time. Uh, Thomas Paine, Thomas More, uh, you know, it's been advocated over the centuries by many, many people. Um, but it really has taken off recently in recent years and it has gone mainstream. There are some very important economists now advocating it. And the one actually that I've uh, has influenced me quite a lot is, uh, is this guy, Martin Sambu. It's a very recent book, The Economics of Belonging. And he's a Financial Times journalist. And, and this has this is formed part of my background um, to this. So you know, journalists like him who are not, as it were, of the left or of the right or anything, actually saying now is the time to consider this. Is it a radical fringe idea? Well, in many ways, yes, it is. But remember, so come up with before Pope Leo XIII in 1891 advocated a just wage and most people most of the bon bourgeois businessmen of Europe thought he was mad or Marxist or both and yet within decades it was firmly part of the Catholic social tradition as of course it is now and it became part of state policy in the early decades of the 20th century so one of the questions I'm asking in opening this, is, is the just is UBI the just wage of our days? In other words, is this a case of a pope, uh, uh, not the first to say, daringly, as it were, wanting to open that door, seeing ahead where the rest of us will one day follow? 
What is the connection uh, with, uh, with Catholic social teaching? Well, I think it should be fairly obvious. I'll just list a couple of principles. Well, four actually. Access, universal access to the goods of creation. We all have a right you know, to shelter, to food and so on. Uh, so this obviously to some extent enables that. It reflects a preferential option for the poor. It arises out of concern, above all for the poor of our society who are the ones uh, most uh, most vulnerable by changing labor patterns. But above all, and this Francis would want to emphasize, it's about the dignity of work. The criticism of this measure uh, is that, well, it somehow allows people not to work, but actually the Pope's advocacy, and I think most sensible advocates say, no, it's a way of enabling work and recognizing work. So in CST, work is a duty, but it's also a right. Where there's a duty, there's a right. And as Pope John Paul II said in Laborum Exercens, work is a share in the creativity of God. In other words, whatever is productive and creative and contributes, that it's work. It's not just waged labor. So this comes in the context of Francis's wanting us in Letter Stream to, to understand, to have an economy which is not just determined by price, that things are of value, value to the community that we need to recognize. Um, you can also say it's pro-woman, you can say it's pro-family, it's pro-community, you can also say it's pro-subsidiarity because it trusts people to know what they need. There's been a very interesting big experiment in Kenya over many years uh, uh, where you know, people were given a certain amount of money every, every month over 12 years. And interestingly, people used it mostly to work more and to earn more. It freed them to work. So this is really what I want to uh, stress about where Francis is coming from, because um, as Cardinal Journey in Rome, in, in uh, uh, Sister Alessandra in Rome, it wrote to me just recently, you know, this is about work. And now I've put a link to Francis's uh, comments to workers in Geneva back in 2017. And I invite you to look at his answer to Michaela, where he says um, he's talking about this as not so much an income for all, but as work for all. It's a wow enabling work for all. This is not about welfare, it's about work. So it begs the question, and I hope we're going to get into this tonight, why is this necessary now? Martin Sanbu is very eloquent, and I think many other experts are very eloquent on the way that labor patterns have changed over the last decades, that paid stable employment and the communities structured around these have largely disappeared. And we have the pain at the moment, which is behind the rise of populism, of people who are being left in a very precarious position. So the, 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 to use us to go from being a proletariat to a precariat, precarity is what describes so much of the contemporary labor, you know, the, 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 the gig economy, the zero sum, the zero hours contract. So we have instability, we have uncertainty, uh, uh, we and we have insecurity, uh, and that has produced a tremendous anxiety and suffering, particularly um, among the poor. So the main reason for the UBI, and we're going to get into this tonight. Uh, you know, there are many reasons people give for it. You know, to help to end poverty, because in recognition of technology. But for me, and I think for Francis, fundamentally, it is about allowing people to access the goods of creation, to access the work, it, to make it easier to participate in the labor market of today. So I wanna um, end, if I may, with, with, the, with Jesus' parable of the landowner, which seems to me, the landowner and the, the, the vineyard who goes to recruit workers for the vineyard, because this, it seems to me, is the parable really for, for the UBI. Now, remember that the landowner in the parable goes out three times to hire workers for the vineyard. And the final time he goes out right at the 11th hour, in other words, right at the end of the day. And he asks the people standing there idly, he says, why are you hanging around doing nothing? And remember they, what they answer is because nobody has hired us. The issue was not their unwillingness to work. And interestingly, the landowner pays them, yes, the same as he paid the others, and that's why we all discuss that parable. But isn't it interesting also that he gives them work, even if it's just for that hour, and pays them the same? Because he understands that their needs are not just a need for a proper income, but also a need to work to participate uh, in society. So my friends, that is why uh, I think Francis is asking us in the context of the collapse in many ways of the old models that are being exposed by the COVID crisis in our reconsideration of a new kind of economy uh, to consider the, uh, the UBI. So with that, those brief uh, words uh, of introduction, I hope helpful ones, I now uh, want to introduce um, our speakers. And 
we're going to begin with Bishop John Arnold, who is the Bishop of Salford, known um, to, to all of you, of course, or many of you. Uh, he serves as the Chair of Trustees of CAFOD, uh, the Catholic Overseas Aid. He pioneers um, ecological regeneration for the bishops and is an all-round uh, great thing. Now, Bishop John has had an incredibly busy day and he's arrived horse of voice. Now, he was worried uh, that he wouldn't be able to make it back in time. So he pre-recorded a video. So with, with your permission, even though he is here among us, we're not going to hear from him, uh, as it were, live, but from the video that he's pre-recorded where he's recorded his message. Thanks, Brendan. An area of change suggests something. Good evening. Pope Francis has said that we are not just in an era of change, but rather in a change of era. An era of change suggests something like having a room which is full of furniture, books, pictures, and the change includes moving things around, discarding something, introducing something else, but the room stays the same shape and size. A change of era suggests that the very structure of the room itself changes, and this new space requires organisation in a very different way and on a much more radical scale. The shift from industrial to digital, along with globalization, the communications revolution, etc., and the so-called liquid society and economy, where so much is transient, was all underway well before the pandemic hit. Just look at the changes to our planet. For the moment, we are continuing to increase the damage of climate change, let alone beginning to repair it. We have conflicts and wars which have caused 100 million people to become either refugees or internally displaced people. We live in a time where the market economy continues to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Can it be true that 1% of the world's population has 50% of the world's wealth, that the 10 richest people have a wealth of 3 billion others combined. Against that background, we have this pandemic which touches every nation with appalling consequences, particularly for the poorer nations where healthcare is primitive or virtually non-existent. But maybe, as Pope Francis hinted, in his moving homily from the steps of St. Peter's 11 months ago, maybe the pandemic challenges us not only to rediscover the very things that nourish, sustain and strengthen our lives and our communities, but also to allow new forms of hospitality, fraternity and solidarity. Pope Francis says there are two ways to emerge from a crisis. We can try to return to where we were before, having learned nothing, or we can emerge the stronger, the wiser, and the more determined to create something better. People talk about returning to normal after the pandemic, but the normal of recent years has really not been working well at all. At the end of the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII, with his document Rerum Novarum, ushered in a renewed way for the church to look at the world, seeking to allow the light of the gospel to show a clear path for the people in a changing industrial age. Catholic social teaching has continued to develop through successive popes into the 21st century. Certain principles underpin our social teaching, above all, the dignity of the human person and of human labor place of the common good and our responsibility for each other. Might universal basic income find its place as an expression of Catholic social teaching? Could it provide a protection for people that affords them dignity? If everyone is given a basic income which would provide for their livelihood, there would be less desperation that leads people to forced migration extreme poverty would be eradicated, bringing security to families. 
people would surely still seek work wherever it was available, but would not be faced with the appalling prospects of long-term unemployment and its anxiety and insecurity. A universal basic income would mean that everyone would have food in a world that can well provide for everyone when its produce is sensibly shared. A universal basic income does not herald a totalitarian state where everyone is required to be the same, which would be a deprivation of our individual dignity, but it would ensure that no one is left behind and no one is beyond reach and marginalised. It would be a milestone in achieving that care for our brothers and sisters. It's my hope that the speakers in this gathering will be able, through their expertise and experience, to see a way to persuade us that establishing a universal basic income can become a reality which would benefit everyone. Thank you. Very much, thank you very much indeed, um, Bishop John. Now, uh, turning to uh, uh, Michael uh, Pugh next. Michael is the director and co-founder of the Basic Income Conversation, uh, which, as he will explain, is all about promoting exactly what we're doing tonight. I contacted him uh, after finishing Letter Stream, and I said, the Pope is calling you for this. Can you help us uh, it, it talk about it? So um, Michael is a real expert in this. He has a background in, in, in community organizing. Um, and uh, Michael, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Austin uh, and, and Brendan as well at Catholic Voices for putting this event on this evening. It's a real pleasure to uh, speak with such a distinguished panel and a big challenge there set by Bishop John to try and try and persuade uh, persuade everyone this evening. I'll do, I'll do my best. My, my role is uh, to share a little bit about uh, basic income. As, as Austin said, some of you will have heard about it before. I know some of you uh, are, are already have given this a lot of thought, perhaps consider yourselves experts, particularly people like Father David Stewart, who's on the call this evening, who's written a whole series of blogs and media pieces uh, about the links between Catholicism and, and basic income. But some of you are coming at this for the first time, so hopefully we can get everybody up to speed uh, with an overview of, of, the, uh, of the basics. Um, so what is a basic income? Uh, the, the core concept is, is simple. Uh, it's the idea of giving a regular cash payment uh, to everyone uh, and forever. It's as simple as that. In the UK, we already ha have a kind of basic income for most children and most pensioners in the form of a child benefit and the state pension. And this is the idea of expanding that to everyone, regardless of your background, regardless of if you're in work or not. Uh, and it would go to each individual but not the household, each individual, for you to spend as you wish, no strings attached. And it would effectively become this income floor that nobody could fall below, but also a springboard for you to aspire to what you really want to be doing in life. And sometimes it's best to think about basic income as a, as a family of ideas. There's, there's different versions that get proposed. And Pope Francis himself mentioned the idea of a negative income tax in his comments last year, which is perhaps more considered like a cousin of universal basic income in that family. But while there are different proposals of how much it would be and, and, and how you would implement it in practice, the core concept is, is the same. And it's based on this idea that we all have a right to financial security, particularly at a time like now when so many of us are experiencing insecurity. Now, as Austin said, the basic income is an old idea. It's, it was a long tradition across, uh, across the political spectrum, dating back centuries. It's been gathering pace, though, as, as an idea in the last five years, as a potential solution to, I think, an interrelated set of problems. And I think those problems are best summed up by this sense of instability that now grips our society. Insecurity is perhaps the overwhelming experience of the modern age. People are insecure in their work insecure in their housing, insecure in their mental health, uh, uh, very often in, in debt. And this is being driven by our unstable climate and our unstable politics. And the systems that were previously there or designed to catch us when we fall are broken and outdated and are now unable to meet the changing patterns of work in particular in, in the 21st century. And perhaps most importantly though, 
And I think this is what I read from, from what Pope Francis was referencing last year, is the issue that the hardest and most valuable work in society, such as parenting children or looking after loved ones, is currently valued at zero by the market and the state. And that work is all, and that work is almost entirely unpaid. And basic income can help us reimagine what work and contribution really means in a society and how that should be valued. And as Bishop John uh, said, the COVID pandemic signals a change of era um, and it has exposed just how urgently we need a basic income. We've all experienced uh, insecurity in some way, but as you know, I think it's exposed the deep inequalities in our, uh, in our society where, where some have been suffering worse than others. And our existing social security system in the UK, certainly, but perhaps elsewhere as well, is proving ill-equipped at supporting people through the crisis. We've seen millions of people and families fall through the gaps in the government support schemes. And we've heard already and heard a lot over the last few months, people compare the pandemic to, to World War II and the talk to the, the, of the need to build back better. And indeed, we must use this moment to build a system that's fit to face the challenges of the 21st century. And it's been really exciting to see an unprecedented cross-party coalition of politicians and, and, and public figures coming out and backing basic income in the last year as support and interest in the idea grows and grows by the day as shown by the number of you on, on the call this evening. So, so what, what, um, why is basic income part of the, the solution to those problems I've outlined? It really can be our generation's NHS. Basic income can give everyone a basic level of security and with security comes a number of things comes freedom to make choices that's best for you and your family. So that might be balancing jobs, going back into education to learn new skills, spending more time uh, caring for loved ones or volunteering in your parish or local community. Security also makes us healthier. Uh, basic income pilots have shown to improve health of people and society more generally. It leads to less stress, less social isolation, reduced crime, uh, reduced domestic violence. Security also builds resilience to shocks. Uh, and in many ways, it's not really the amount of money, uh, but it's the regularity of it that is important. It's the knowing that at least something is coming in each week that you can rely on, especially during moments of unexpected events. Security gives people the chance to take risks as well, to be entrepreneurial. That might be starting your own business, going self-employed or starting a community project. Um, and in turn, basic income would be a major stimulus uh, to our particularly local economies and, and revive, uh, revive the high street. Security also gives the power to say no, uh, no to exploitative relationships, whether that's a, a partner or a boss or a landlord or a trafficker, giving people the freedom to walk away with a cushion of financial safety to fall back on. But basic income is fundamentally about justice. Um, because these changes would disproportionately benefit the most disadvantaged and marginalised groups in society, particularly working class and ethnically diverse communities. So has this happened uh, elsewhere uh, in the world? It's never been fully implemented in a whole country, but there have been plenty of localised trials around the world. The most recent of this was, uh, was, was Finland, uh, which was the pilot was a success. It saw uh, improvements in mental health and well-being. And it actually saw a slight increase in people in work, which yet again debunks this myth that people would somehow stop working if they had a basic income. That has never proven to be the, being the case in, in any study. Uh, it's the impacts on health that are consistently replicated around the world, wherever it's been piloted, particularly in the pilots in Canada, which saw large drops in A&E admissions uh, and improvements in mental health in the areas that had basic income. But ultimately, it was the stories of people who received basic income that moved me the most. Uh, I was lucky enough to visit North America a couple of summers ago to visit some of those pilots. And two phrases leapt out at me. Uh, one was in Stockton, California, where pilot participants over and over again used the phrase, I can breathe again. And in Ontario, uh, a woman called Dana told me, I feel human again. And ultimately, it's this human dignity that basic income gives, taking the boot off people's necks so we can breathe again and doing away with the stigma so often attached to being on, on, on benefits. And that's basic income's real power.
And the exciting thing is that there's a lot of interest in piloting a basic income in the UK. The Scottish government had just completed a feasibility study uh, into what pilots could look like there. Uh, the Welsh Senate uh, has recently passed a motion to explore pilots further. And there's over, over 20 local authorities across the UK who have called for pilots in their areas as well. And internationally, there's great interest, of course, lots of uh, work going on around basic income. I think we're going to hear later um, from some of the plans uh, afoot in Ireland uh, for a basic income programme for creatives uh, and the role that Catholic Church has played there. Uh, I'm almost finished. So basic income is potentially, obviously, it's, it's a potential to, to radically change the way we live. And, and, the, and it's obviously a big shift in, in how we think about society and the economy. So inevitably, people have questions and challenges to the idea. I'm sure we're going to hear more later this evening. You'll all be wondering, well, how much cash are we actually talking about here? Most models in the UK suggest a basic income of somewhere, but it's, it's somewhere between 250 and 500 pounds a month that would be like an income floor that sits below the rest of the existing welfare system. Now, obviously, that's not enough, enough to live on on its own, but even at that modest level, it would reduce poverty significantly and significantly reduce inequality. How we pay for it is another question that often comes up. Um, there's kind of two main ways of thinking about this, if you like, uh, to oversimplify it. One is a, a more progressive tax system that would see the wealthiest pay more in taxes, whether that's from income or wealth taxes or other, other forms of tax. Uh, and then there's another way of thinking about which is which is equally sharing out things that we all have a stake in. So like profits from our data, perhaps, or uh, from our natural resources, like things like a carbon tax. For example, in Alaska, uh, they have a form of a basic income in, in the form of a dividend that they give out at the end of each year uh, based on their profits from the oil reserves uh, in the state. Um, why should most people, why should everyone get it, is, is another question. Shouldn't we be targeting support to those that need it most? And the reality is that means testing often doesn't work. The, the more the government aims, the more it often misses. And the basic income is the simplest and fairest way of giving everyone some financial security. Yes, the wealthiest would get it as well. And that's right, because we are all members of the same society and no one deserves special treatment. But they would pay back their basic income and more in, in, in tax, most likely. Finally, uh, we, we're not, at least us at the basic income conversation are not, talking about a basic income that would replace the entire welfare system, much of it many of us have fought for many years to, to build and retain. Basic income would provide a solid foundation load upon which you can build additional support for those that need it most for, and, and sit alongside or in addition to uh, disability benefit, housing benefit, those kind of additional needs that people have. So that's enough of my voice for now. I'll be here on the panel to answer some of the, more, some of the questions later. <clears throat> Back to you, Austin. Thanks very much, Mike. That's very, very clear. And we will be digging in some of these a bit more, how this is to be paid for and so on, uh, when we come uh, to the Q&A. Now, um, the next speaker, uh, I asked, her, what do you think about universal basic income? And she was a little bit sceptical. And I said, that's great. That's what we need. Uh, Ruth Kelly was recently appointed by Pope Francis to the Council for the Economy in the Vatican, which oversees Vatican finances, and I think is just fresh from approving this year's uh, Vatican budget, I think, Ruth. So uh, we're delighted to have her. She's, of course, uh, a former uh, Lab Labour Party politician, an MP, served under Blair and Brown, um, and uh, recently, until recently, Vice President also of St. Mary's University. So uh, former banker, eminently qualified. Ruth, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Austin, and thank you very much to Catholic Voices for organising this, because um, it is really, really important that we debate how properly to help people who are on the margins of society. And so I wanted to start with what I agree with, because as you say, there are some elements of the universal basic income, uh, Austin, that I don't um, fully sign up to at this stage, at least. So, so what do I agree with? Well, I completely agree with your comments at the, at the beginning that clarified what Pope Francis said that there should be a real focus on work as part of the fundamental dignity of what it means to be a human being. And for societies everywhere right across the world, that means that core to their policy programme ought to be a programme to enable people to get into good jobs and be able to progress in those jobs. So absolutely 100% agree with that. 
I also completely agree with your focus on um, the, the specific needs of the gig economy. And this is something that in Britain has become um, more manifest in recent years, but in other parts of the world is an absolutely massive problem, uh, particularly um, agricultural workers, for instance, people who work in, in rural economies. So understanding and addressing the needs of people in the gig economy, economy is, uh, is really, really important. I completely agree, too, with the focus on tackling poverty and the needs of the poor. Again, that ought to be right at the centre of the debate. And uh, lastly, perhaps, and completely critically, is on valuing care. Care is a form of work. We, uh, mothers who bring up, or indeed fathers who bring up children, um, people who look after elderly relatives, uh, those who care for the disabled or others who are vulnerable, these are, you know, these are real jobs that need to be properly valued by society. So to start with those comments, th these are areas that I think are completely fundamental. I'm going to now take us through some of the arguments for a universal basic income. And while I may be sceptical about how the term is sometimes used, I'm going to end up, I hope, in a pretty positive place for taking some of this debate forward. So first to go to what Michael, uh, how Michael was defining what a universal basic income is. Uh, so we've heard that universal basic income is unconditional. You don't have to do anything to merit it, possibly apart from being over the age of 18, which I think is a debate that can be had. So it's not linked to any requirement to look for work. It's not contingent on, on, on being ill or having any sort of illness or disability. In that sense, it's very different to another concept that we have, which is the idea of a guaranteed minimum income. That may seem like a subtle point of difference, but, it, but it's really quite important philosophically as well as, as, well as practically. So many countries, um, uh, developed countries, do already provide a guaranteed minimum income to, put to, to people so that they don't have to go without necessities. It's a fundamental part of our welfare state. And as Michael has said, he's campaigned for uh, issues in the welfare state in the past, and it's really, really important that those continue to be, to be provided. And the way that states generally do this in developed countries is by topping up the incomes of people in work and providing a safety net for people who fall out of work and can't be supported within their family situation. The critical difference here uh, between a minimum guaranteed income and a universal basic income is that a universal basic income is, as it were, you might say, an income of first resort. It's given by the state for you to have no matter what your situation, where a guaranteed minimum income is a top up. So as it were, what you earn comes first, and then the state provides something on top of that if you're not earning enough um, to meet your basic requirements as it were. Um, so, so that's the sort of philosophical point that we may come, come back to uh, later. So I just want to consider a few things about the universal basic income model, uh, which is the income of first resort. First of all, how much would it cost? And I know that it's completely dependent on, on where the level is set and so forth, and you can have a big debate about that. But arguably, um, if it's too low, it won't provide the security that people need to be able to turn down a job if they're you know, in very difficult situations, if they're insecure, if they're, if they're between jobs and so forth. For it to be a really serious um, alternative to low paid employment, it does require very hefty levels of taxation. So one of the preeminent economists of uh, our day today, John Kay, looked at this and did some modeling. And a very simple way of thinking about it is, if we think that a universal basic income should be set at about 50% of the median income of average incomes, which is really quite low, but you might think is just about sensible, then we need to think of that as putting half of our entire national income that we make every year towards the universal basic income. That's what the 50% figure means. To fund that, tax, tax rates, the tax take would need to be 50%. And on top of that, you'd have to fund education and health and all the other services that the state provides. So you already begin to see that the tax, average tax rate that would be needed to fund even quite a modest level of universal basic income would be very, very high indeed. 
John Kay himself says if it was set at 40% of median earnings, which is actually below the level, significantly below the level that people think is needed for subsistence, uh, all tax rates would need to rise by about 20 percentage points. So it's a very, very expensive policy. So the question then becomes, would it in fact work? Well, if we look at, say, um, the large numbers of workers in precarious employment, in receipt of irregular incomes, and there are millions throughout the world. I mean, we're talking here about the UK, but actually this is probably a much bigger issue in uh, continents like Africa uh, and Asia, where there really are uh, very, very, very many people working in very precarious situations where their employment contracts aren't even enforceable if they have employment contracts at all. Now, that is such a major issue that it's actually much deeper than universal basic income is ever going to be able to solve because those are the very same countries that can't raise significant tax revenue in the first place because they don't have the legal systems that would allow them to do it. The sorts of countries in which you might be able to do it are precisely those countries that don't have very many people in insecure employment, that don't have very high levels of unemployment, that have a very strong tax base from which you can raise revenue, and that have a really significant degree of social consensus that might get behind such a policy uh, such as this. In other words, a country just like Finland, for instance, where they have been carrying out a small scale uh, trial of universal basic income, it would be, I would argue, very difficult to do this in any sort of, of economy. Which doesn't say, of course, that we shouldn't be talking about it and that we shouldn't uh, try. Would it, however, actually solve poverty is the other issue in a developed country, for instance, like, like the UK. And one of the reasons why it's thought that it might, even if set at a relatively low level, is because it would take away all the bureaucracy uh, with applying for, for benefits and universal credit and so forth that exist at the moment, a housing benefit, for council tax benefit, for all the other benefits. And it becomes an entitlement and a right that you receive a certain basic level. But because it goes to everybody and you don't, um, uh, uh, as it were, it goes to the rich, to the, to the poor who happen to be in rich households, uh, as well as the really, uh, really poor people, it can't be high enough to really combat poverty of those who really need it. So you end up having to add on, as Michael in fact uh, recognised, is you have to add on all sorts of other benefits to cope for the needs of people who are really poor. You'd have to add on disability benefits, you'd have to uh, add on housing benefits, you'd have to add on all sorts of other benefits to meet their specific needs. So in a way it can't be as simple uh, as some of the proponents you know, argue that, that it might be. So those are some uh, real, uh, real issues with it. And lastly, and I think this comes back to the philosophical point, should it be used to recognize the incredibly valuable work of carers and particularly carers in the home? Now, while I think it is incredibly important to recognize care, I don't think as it were paying for care is the right way to do it. Um, I would argue that a universal basic income as predicated, as put forward at the moment, is an extraordinarily individualistic benefit. There is no concept of family attached to it. So lots of carers, not all carers, but lots of carers live in families who choose between the husband and wife or whoever the, the parents are to organize work in such a way that one of them works more and one of them works less so that they can support their children. Uh, they are taxed as a family unit, not, uh, they're, sorry, they are taxed as individuals, not as a family unit. Um, the benefit system works um, as a family benefit. So trying to introduce a universal um, basic income would disrupt the whole way the current benefit system works mm -hmm. and bring in an individual component. Uh, so, so Real issues, I think, as to how that would work in practice. What do I think we should do? Well, actually, funny enough, when I was in government and worked with Gordon Brown, he tried to bring in something called a working families tax credit, which has now been replaced by the universal credit. And in his view, and I think it was a very interesting philosophical idea, the working families tax credit 
was supposed to remove the stigma associated with um, topping up people whose uh, incomes, whose uh, incomes were too low for subsistence at a family level. Um, he actually wanted to integrate tax benefits, tax credits into the, the, uh, the tax system so that they would, as it were, become a negative income tax and be, be handed out really simply through the tax system once a month or however often you chose to, uh, to, to, to do it to recognise people's circumstances. And if they were in very low paid work or out of work, their incomes would be topped up. Uh, towards uh, a more decent level. If they were in work at a certain level, then they'd have to pay taxes into the tax system. So it would work as a sort of negative, a negative income tax. He was never able to do that because taxes were, were individual and the working tax credit um, was a, a family benefit. The only way of recognizing how families work would be to change the nature of the tax system, actually, so that they both worked at a family level. So I think that this is a hugely important discussion, Got it. but one that needs to move beyond the idea of an individualized universal basic income towards one that recognizes that families are the sort of primary unit in society, that people make really difficult and complex judgments within that family unit as to how they work, how they look after each other, how they share income um, between those people that need them. Uh, and think about how we can reduce the stigma of, as it were, the state topping up incomes and supporting the family uh, in different ways. So I think there's a conversation to be had, but I think it's about the negative income tax. Super, Ruth, thanks so much. I'm very grateful for those very nuanced remarks. Um, just, and I'm not taking sides here, but just so you know that uh, Malcolm Torrey, who's something of an expert on this, has um, in, in the chat, you'll see, is linked to a, uh, a source where apparently John Kay's modelling is has, has been highly questioned. Just just so people know that, uh, I'm, as I say, I'm not an economist. I don't know about this. Um, so thank you so much, Ruth, for for those raising all those very very important sceptical questions. And who better to answer them uh, but the next speaker, Sister Alessandra Smerili, is the uh, coordinator of the Economic Task Force of the Vatican COVID Commission. This is the commission appointed by Pope Francis to, as it were, redesign you know, the post-COVID world. Um, she's got a, a long list of, of achievements, which I won't list, except to say that um, uh, in her distinguished career, she also was for a while in the University of East Anglia where she got her doctorate. So she knows Britain well. Um, and Sister Alessandra, delighted to have you. And I know you've got some slides to show us, so welcome. Thank you for, very much for inviting me to this very nice and exciting webinar. I don't know if Brendan can share my uh, slides or I have to do it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So I'm very pleased to, to be part of this very uh, interesting panel. And uh, when Pope Francis established the Vatican COVID Commission, uh, he gave us a task prepare the future please be concrete uh, and this is what i think uh, we are doing here uh, he said i'm thinking of, of what will come next the future in its economic and social consequences i'm asking you to do it to do it in two ways with positive sciences projections and with imagination. So I think this webinar represents a way to take the words of Pope Francis seriously and to imagine something new, something that does not exist. Uh, so I'm very grateful to Hosen and uh, you based in UK for organizing this uh, webinar. So we can go to the following slides. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we can go forward. Uh, this is um, what we are trying to do as a commission, uh, taking this crisis as an opportunity. Uh, how? Uh, to promote a new universal solidarity starting from the last. Restore harmony with the environment, but we need spiritual conversion as a guiding path. And talking about well-being, we, uh, healthy people, healthy institution and planet. When uh, this is a, a part of a, a Pope speech, he says, I hope that this time of danger will free us from operating on automatic pilot. 
shake our sleepy, co sleepy consciences and allow a humanist and ecological conversion that puts an end to the idolatry of money and places human life and dignity at the center. I think this uh, is our uh, aim, what we are going to do. So we need a kind of conversion. And uh, we, we see that uh, we are going through uh, something that is changing the world and we, we should prepare the future, which is different, Pope Francis says, of being prepared for the future. So we can go on. And uh, as economic task force, uh, our goal is to help ensure the most vulnerable, including the earth, are represented in action undertaken to overcome the economic crisis generated by the pandemic. So regeneration and not just a restart. We know, thanks to the pandem pandemic, we are facing uh, exponential job losses, growing unemployment, lack of equal opportunity across social needs, and burdening debt. And uh, the human, political, and social costs of the crisis will certainly not be distributed equally between rich and poor, workers and unemployed, between stable and precarious workers, between young and old, uh, be between men and women. Uh, so uh, our question is, will, will we be able to meet the needs of the most vulnerable or we will close each one in its small, in its small and myopic individual interest? Uh, so if we can go on, uh, our attention is focused on solutions to widening inequalities, the labor market and the role of business as and new models for the financial debt market. And uh, among all these, we are, uh, we are paying a special attention to the future of work and uh, uh, in this domain, universal basic income is a seemly, seem, it seems a radical solution. Our question, because I think the, the aim of this web, webinar is to raise questions, not just not giving answer because we don't have answers, I think. And uh, if we can start a process starting from, from now, I think Pope Francis will be pleased. So can universal basic income be the tool that guarantees dignity for workers, whatever their job? We can go on. And uh, I'm not commenting uh, all of this stuff because uh, uh, the previous speakers uh, already did it. But uh, we know the characteristics of universal basic income are individual, universal, uh, unconditional. So uh, I know um, there, there is a bit of concerns as Ruth were, uh, was saying before about families and uh, individualism being uh, an individual um, payment because it's assigned to a single person. Uh, maybe, uh, I mean, in some states like in Italy, some family, uh, subsidies or uh, payments and so on, sometimes uh, they tend to uh, penalize uh, families with respect to individual uh, people, persons. So uh, maybe we, we, we might to go deeper into, into this and also uh, it could be a way to reshape relationships between men and women. And, uh, but uh, we can say, if I have time, I'm going to say something uh, later on on this. Uh, is universal, can we go back? Uh, is universal and maybe being universal, so without income test uh, can be, um, can mitigate the uh, poverty uh, trap uh, because with uh, minimum minimum wages or um, some uh, subsidies that uh, you have until you reach a level of income uh, can discourage uh, people 
uh, to overcome this level. And so uh, I agree that uh, on uh, the first comments on security issues and se being uh, security um, a condition for uh, uh, being entrepreneurial, you know, is unconditional. So with work requirements, and uh, I know the criticism and uh, I read that I was reading, I was going through the chat and uh, it's very lively. Um, so I'm convinced and all the Catholic tradition works in this way that work is a fundamental need of soul. Uh, but uh, uh, this is true in particular when we speak of creative work free from uh, uh, limiting arbitrary and often coercive effect as it sides from institutions, however democratic. Um, then there are situations in which people get sick because they work too much and have to continue working because if they reduce their work, they would not be compensated. Uh, there are other situations in which people get sick because they cannot find work. Uh, so, with universal basic income, it would facilitate the transfer of time work between those who work too much and those who work too little, maybe. And uh, uh, the objective of public policies must not be so much to promote employment or employability from the first day uh, they finish their studies until they the day they retire, but rather to encourage their development and their full human flowering through an education process that begins in the cradle and ends uh, well beyond the retirement ages. age. So public policies should be assessed more in terms of their impact on human capital production than on the basis of unemployment rates. So, UB, the universal basic income, can facilitate uh, this because it's unconditional and uh, uh, can facilitate a greater alternation of training, work, family through the lifespan, which would otherwise be possible only for the rich and for the children of the rich by reproducing uh, this increasing of inequality of situations and uh, um, opportunity. So we can go on. Mm, I'm not commenting this one because uh, some people, the, the, the previous speaker mm, said something and I don't have a much, much time, but uh, we know that uh, uh, universal basic income can seen as uh, uh, a tool for preventing poverty, to respond to expected job losses, and uh, to allow for choice in rejection of dangerous underpaid employment. I was reading in the chat that uh, uh, this can uh, um, raise a problem on uh, inflation cost, uh, because uh, if uh, we reshape these relationships, and uh, um, if uh, um, the cost of labor raise, uh, maybe this can result in uh, higher prices, but uh, I know people were, was already, were already um, answering to this on the chat tool, but this is a topic in which we need to go deeper. And so this is, these are some questions that uh, we need to address. We can go on. So uh, going deeper, um, I think, first of all, we have to uh, answer to this question uh, and somebody was saying that, should we support someone uh, remembering the, the, the first debate uh, among uh, Philip Van Paris and uh, Rawls uh, between crazy and lazy uh, people? So should we support someone who serves all day, all day of Malibu? Uh, and um, there is a debate uh, on that. Uh, is it moral to subsidize the lazy uh, with the resources, with productive people? 
is certain, it is certainly moral to subsidize all those who housewives, caregivers, or other, others perform a job and provide involuntarily unpaid services. And so if universal basic income can be the best, the way to guarantee true freedom to all and especially to the less of, uh, I think that uh, also the roles uh, principle of difference is satisfied. This uh, principle states social and economic inequalities are just only if they result in compensating benefit for everyone and in, in particular for the least advantaged member of society. So mm, we should think, think if uh, uh, this can be a way to uh, subsidize the worst of people. But on the other way, uh, we have to ask to ourselves, I, I still have two minutes, to ourselves, uh, if we have to prepare the future toward which world do we want to go? And so uh, we have to pursue a shared vision of integral human, human development. And uh, we know the Pope uh, in, is uh, asking, is saying, uh, I want all of us to think about the project of integral human development that we long for, and that is based on the central role and initiative of the people in all their diversity, as well as on universal access to those trees or else for uh, England that you defend. Trabajo, which is labor, techo is housing or uh, livelihood, 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 and tierra, which is land and food. So uh, Pope, Francis, Pope Francis' wish recalls the principle of the universal destination of goods lands and its fruits are not our, so they are given to us and everyone must have access to them. At the same time, the fruits we share are also the results of the work of transformation of the world and everyone should be able to contribute to this work. Thus, the world we aspire is one in which there are opportunities for everyone. Universal basic income is a tool but maybe is it possible to rethink the world of work, the social norms connected to jobs? And so the third uh, point prioritize a collective importance of care. And uh, here, um, care we know is a dimension and in Fratelli Tutti Pope Francis is reminding this, uh, a dimension that uh, we have failed to adequately foster in our society, in the public sphere. And uh, to better balance work and care times, and I think this can go on with universal basic income, and to give everyone, men and women, the ability to learn how to take care of one another and of the nature, a proposals come from uh, the Canadian philosopher, Jennifer Nedeschi. And she is just imagining something like that. This may be a matter for another webinar. Is uh, to, um, she proposed, because she says care and work are two fundamental dimensions of human be being. So he, she's proposing to work all less and to dedicate oneself to care activities. So the hours freed from work could be returned to society in different way for the care of children, the elderly, the weak. So everybody taking care from one another. And he proposed that the full time, the actual full time can become, the, what we call now full time can become, can be, the, sorry, what it is now part time can be the new full time rule for jobs. And the remaining hours should be devoted to uh, care activities in the community, not the market care, but the kind of care we can give each other. So I, I, I'm concluding, and sorry for taking your time, that with the last word, we can go to the conclusion that uh, all work does not translate into job. We know that work is greater than jobs and life is greater than work. Care 
for others, essential to our existence and equity is essential also for the quality of common life. So we need to address these issues. And uh, if universal basic income can offer a pathway to safeguard care and equity is welcome. If we need to reshape our social norms about work, this is good. Uh, but uh, what is more important is to start a debate, a process, and uh, I'm telling you as uh, uh, the coordinator of uh, uh, economic task force for the Vatican COVID Commission, if you are ready to start a lab, we can do it together and we can go something in this respect, because I think we need to go deeper into everything uh, is being said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Alessandra, um, for giving us the, the big thinking in Rome behind this. This is a tool, uh, a possible tool for achieving some of that uh, deeper rethinking that Pope Francis wants us to engage in in, in the post-COVID world. And just your last point, I just want to uh, just stress this, in Let Us Dream, he does say further down, by providing a universal basic income, we can free and enable people to work for the community in a dignified way. So part of this rethink is about the context in which we need actually an economy in which we consume less and regenerate more. And that may require people doing things which don't have price in the market, but have huge value to the community. And the UBI could be one way in which we put a value on that. We allow, we allow it to happen as it were, in a way that the market doesn't. So thank you so much for those remarks and thank you to all the speakers. Now, um, questions and comments have been coming absolutely thick and fast uh, and I've been watching them. One of you is just asking, where do we put the questions? The Q&A is the proper place for questions, but we are keeping an eye on the chat as well. Now, I'm going to um, take a, a bit of a liberty here and I'm going to take two sort of very simple ideas from all of these comments, two questions that seem to come up a lot. One is on how this is actually paid for and whether it is, as Ruth says, you know, an incredible burden on uh, taxation and on, on the economy because there are many, many different views about this. So who will pay for it? Um, and I just want to mention in this respect, by the way, some confusion about the negative income tax. Uh, according to Martin Sanbu, um, the way that the UBA could operate is that um, is that all taxpayers have the same flat sum deducted from their tax bill. Those who earn so little that the deduction is greater than the amount that they owe in taxes would receive the difference in the form of a cash payout. So for most people, it would be the same as that. You would lose that tax-free threshold of what is it, £12,000. Um, so, you know, there are many different ways of paying for this. And at a certain level, as I understand it, but there are other experts out there, and this is contested, wouldn't actually add much anyway to the tax burden. But anyway, the key issue here is how, how would it be paid for? Um, but also, um, uh, um, would, and this is a question from Steve at Brennemeyer, would the system, would the UBI result in more people moving into the black economy in effect? You know, because you'd, you'd, you'd create more work below, you know, in, in the black, uh, uh, which is, I think, a very interesting question. And then the other series of questions and objections is the effect on behavior. Now, somebody asked very early on in the chat, you know, human motivation, the fear is here that it will encourage laziness, it'll encourage unhealthy dependence upon the state as a provider. That's come up from a couple of you. Now, to answer those two questions, I want to turn um, to Father Sean Healy. Now, Father Sean is, is, wasn't a panelist, but he's got in touch since we announced this. Um, he uh, runs Social Justice Ireland. He's a Roman Catholic priest, he's a missionary, and he spent more than a decade uh, in Africa, but he's spearheaded in Ireland, the churches, the Catholic Church's advocacy of UBI. And I wanted him to just share a little bit about his campaign, because just so you know that there is a church somewhere in the English speaking world that has actually moved ahead on this very far. So I want him to tell us about that. And I've, I'm also surprising him with this. He wasn't expecting this. But Father Sean, could you also answer those two uh, questions I've just raised about how it's to be paid for and the effect on human behavior? And you're very welcome. Thank you, Father Sean. Thank you, Austin. Thanks for the surprise as well. Nothing like having uh, sticky questions thrown at the last minute. But anyway, yes, um, I joined the Conference of Religious of Ireland, their Justice Commission in 1983, and became aware of basic income a couple of years later. And by the early 90s, the Conference of Religious of Ireland, which is all the religious congregations, 
their justice commission was advocating basic income as a, 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 a pathway that could be followed in or should be followed in Ireland. It was doing it because it seemed to be to us uh, consistent with um, Catholic social thought and that it dealt with issues like the changing world of work uh, because it was clear to us at that time that jobs weren't the only kind of work and that for people who didn't have a job, they still had a right to work and should have access to uh, some kind of support in that space. But also it was in not just the world of work, but it was also dealing with the lack of income or the need for sufficient income. And it was also dealing with the issue of participation, that people have a right to participate in shaping the world and in shaping the decisions that affect them and shaping the, the, their direction. Uh, by 1997, um, we had done a lot of work in the in the public arena with videos and papers and all that communications of different types. And by then, the government that came into power at that time agreed to publish a green paper. Uh, and they did that before they left office in 2002. They published a green paper. Interestingly enough, in the light of the discussion tonight, that green paper showed that it was possible to introduce a basic income in Ireland, universal basic income, at a relatively low level uh, without actually increasing income tax at all. Um, that would not be the case today, but uh, at the same time, it's good to note that. Um, so after 2002, Ireland was in a Celtic Tiger situation, then it was the bank crash, then the bailout. Uh, after that, Ireland was in a bailout from 2010 to 2013. So these things went on a back burner, but in more recent years, they've come back again. And at this point, the Conference of Religious of Ireland has gone, had, had closed its Justice Commission. And we had the same people who were involved, Sister Bridget Reynolds and myself, we had set up Social Justice Ireland with the same mandate and the same program of work as we had before. But this time, it was a standalone independent organization. And uh, in uh, as we came into the general election at the start of 2020, a number of uh, political parties in that general election committed to piloting basic a basic income in Ireland if they were elected. The result was that in the program for government of the new uh, uh, government in which came to power in June of 2020, there is a commitment to do uh, to introduce a, ba a universal basic income pilot, and that pilot is now starting to be discussed and so on. It looks one of one of the possibilities. In fact, maybe the the favorite possibility for introducing the pilot is that it would be a pilot basic income for artists and entertainers. They, they have come to the fore in the context of the COVID pandemic and the fact that they are losing out very much. Um, they, I, we ourselves in Basic Income Ireland, or sorry, in, um, in uh, Social Justice Ireland, um, uh, have been discussing with the government in Ireland um, how that might be actually done, and we have developed a model about how it could be uh, rolled out and tested over a number of the next few years. We expect to see some progress on it in the not too distant future. Just to say that in that in the context of um, the Social Justice Ireland promoting this, in re more recent years we have been joined by a coalition of which we're part, a coalition of group of people uh, under the banner of Basic Income Ireland who promote it as well. So. Um, there, uh, you asked me to, to can it be paid for. We have done a whole series of different studies, and they're available on our website, socialjustice.ie, uh, and they show that it can be paid for. They show different ways of paying for it. They show basically how uh, it's very dictated by what you what it costs, and so on. It's obviously dictated by the level that you set it at, and we have different proposals there. And what was the last question you asked me to cover, Austin? It's, it's the effect on behavior. I mean, this has come a lot. Well, the effect on behavior. Yeah, uh, what is your, when you've looked at this, what, what has been the evidence about the, the incentive or disincentive of the UBI? The interesting, our, our experience is quite interesting in this because it's the reverse of what we usually hear from people. People are afraid that it'll help, it'll maybe encourage people to do nothing uh, and give up their jobs and work and so on. In actual fact, we have found the opposite. That uh, with any incentive at all or with any support of any kind, the vast majority of people want to be active, they want to participate, they want to work. And I have a very simple thing, which might be something that your um, the, 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 the attendees here this evening might put to themselves. Ask yourself a question. If you were given a basic income, 
close, we'll say, to the lowest welfare rate or slightly below it or whatever, would you give up uh, your job? Would you give up working? And I, th I have yet to meet a person, I've been asking that question for 30 years, and I yet to meet anybody who would say yes to that. They always say, no, no, of course I wouldn't. I'd take it, but I'd build on it. The interesting thing is, we, we suspect other people might do it, but we never think that we ourselves would do it. In actual fact, the vast, vast majority would, act, would work further, do other things, and be freed up to do other things, but certainly be involved and work. Uh, there, there will always be a few chancers who decide that they're going to do nothing. There'll be a, a desperately small minority, uh, and in, in reality, there's uh, the vast, vast majority of people will actually be uh, doing more than they would have done in situations where they were confined by the welfare system. Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of paradox there, isn't it? The people, when they're liberated from too much anxiety and insecurity, are actually better able to work. There's a lot of evidence in that respect. Now, thank you so much, uh, Father Sean. It's heartening to know that the church has you know, already moved a long way. So we have Ireland uh, to look to uh, uh, as an example. Um, and we'll follow with great interest the pilot scheme that you've talked about. Now, I'm going to um, throw a question to Mike Q. Well, it's actually one of the comments from uh, from Sam Burke, who's a, who's a Dominican. And Sam uh, has, has put a, a rather a devastating bit of rhetoric there. See if you can respond to it. She, listening to Ruth, uh, he says, I, I think Ruth just made the killer point. Let's see if you agree if it's a killer point. It can't be high enough, talking about the UBI, it can't be high enough to matter without disproportionately benefiting those who don't need it and being unaffordable. Um, so what do you, how do you respond to that, Mike? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, something that we hear often. I would say that even at that modest level, let's say we're saying, people have mentioned earlier, let's say 500 pounds a month, that's obviously not enough to live on, but it is a life-changing amount of money. We've talk, heard in the chat in particular about, about the family, let's say it's a family of four, um, you know, in, in one household, when you put that together, that is, that, is a, that is a lot of money to do stuff with that they otherwise wouldn't have had. And um, I think sometimes we speak with a degree of privilege if we sort of uh, say that that small amount of money isn't going to be, uh, isn't going to matter or, or do much. I think that, that for many, many big people, certainly in the UK and around the world, it really would. The second point I'd make is it's not just about the amount it's the regularity of it. Now, the, the kind of modern experience in the workplace is the unpredictable fluctuating incomes that people have where they don't know, particularly in the gig economy, what they're going to have month to month, and particularly on universal credit where your, your income fluctuates according to what work you did in the previous month. And it's, that un, it's the, the knowing that there's going to be a regular amount that comes in is the important thing that gives security to people not necessarily the amount on its own. And then the final thing, I mean, the question was like, does it disproportionately benefit those who don't need it? The evidence is the opposite. So actually all of the, uh, a lot of the models that have taken place in the UK, we can probably seek some of them out and put them in the chat. I know Malcolm Torrey's evidence is in there somewhere in the depths of the chat, um, is the opposite. So actually it disproportionately benefits those at the lower income um, scale. Uh, and that's of course, that's what brings it, makes it a just uh, model. So, so I, I don't think it's a killer point, basically. Yeah. Thanks very much. Now, I, I want to put a question that comes from a rather uh, eminent place. That's to say from, um, from the Moscow State University, we, we, who is participating in this, um, and Professor Elena Veduta and her assistant. And the question is specifically for Sister Alessandra, and it's an interesting one. Uh, we know that human labor is a virtue, human work is a virtue. Um, how is it planned to achieve full employment of the population if basic income is provided? Let me rephrase the question. Do you fear that the that UBI could undermine um, the ideal of a full employment society? And if I can ask it in a yet another way, do you think a full employment society is an objective to which the church you know, should be working or we should be advocating? Thanks. Here I am. Uh, sorry. First of all, um, thank you for this question. And uh, um, uh, thank you for the professor 
Elena Veduta, and I'm going to tell her that I received her letter, but uh, she sent this letter, I think, a month ago, and I received just in, in this day, so I'm going to reply. And uh, about the question, I think, uh, as I was saying before, uh, as a commission, we are thinking uh, to the whole picture, not only the income and the universal basic income. So. Um, uh, we don't feel that, uh, I mean, we have to work uh, on this stream of the future of work uh, and um, which will be, we, we have to prepare the future of work and the future jobs today. Uh, and uh, we have to reshape social norms about work and jobs and maybe universal basic income can be a tool. So, um, I mean, the, it's, it's not a mantra, but saying that everything is connected uh, is something that is true, and uh, we cannot see, see an angle without seeing uh, the others, you know. So, uh, I know it's complicated, but uh, it's part of this process to try to imagine something new but uh, in, in the, the whole, we have to see, as I said, the whole picture and think as universal basic income, maybe as a tool, but uh, we, we have to, uh, to imagine uh, which kind of world and future for job and works we are thinking of. Thank you very much. Now, sadly, time is, is, is very, very short. Um, and I, I'm told that I have to end um you know by eight so we can't keep, we can't keep it going beyond that so i just want to this is a, a a final question but it will lead on to things as you'll discover um and i want to go to father david stewart uh jesuit who's written about this uh in america magazine and elsewhere dave you have a question sorry i'm supposed to read out the question uh, i've just remembered i have to read out the question just a second uh because we can't go to him um the question is a twofold uh what is now uh gonna happen um let me just find this i'm so sorry uh there we go uh rough roughly it's yes here we go um since in large part this webinar came about because pope francis has encouraged this discussion. I'd like to ask now if more detailed papal teaching or reflection might be forthcoming on this, or if one of the, the dicasteries, that's to say the Vatican departments, might be encouraged to undertake that research and what form that might take. And um, Sister Alessandra, I think you've kind of answered this because I, you know, you've made clear that this is this is just beginning and you're interested in partnerships and dialogue. But just answer quite briefly, can you? Can we expect you know, anything from Rome in terms of guidance, teaching, research that could help to steer this discussion? Well, I think the, the idea of the Vatican COVID Commission, when Pope Francis established the Vatican COVID Commission, had in mind something different of uh, respect the usual way in which uh, we are working in Rome, which is basically sometimes a top-down process. And in establishing this commission, Pope Francis says, so please uh, collaborate to everyone who is willing to do something. And so uh, we, are, we are working with lots of partners around the world. Uh, and um, and we, establish, we are establishing groups and some groups. We are working on blockchain, on measurements, on um, food, uh, vaccine, and everything else in collaboration with others. We are not leading processes. We are just uh, creating and giving the space uh, for uh, um, nurture these processes. So uh, please, if you want, I leave it to you, Austin. If you want to start something, uh, we are on board and uh, we can uh, do something together. That's that's wonderful to hear. Uh, and of course, that's um, for, for Bishop John and the other bishops who are listening to this. Um, it would be great at some point to hear from you, your reaction to tonight. But the next part of Dave's um, question was actually about how we, the people of the church, 
um, can or indeed if we should take this on. So um, in order to answer that question, we'd now like to do a quick poll. And this is really a, a flash poll. Uh, and it's, um, can I do this, Brendan? Are we ready to do it? Uh, uh, shall I ask the question? Yes. Yeah, the question is very simple. Do you believe the Catholic Church in the U? I mean, we've seen the complexities of this. They're enormous. The question is very simple. Do you believe the Catholic Church in the UK, England, Wales, Scotland, Wales, should explore UBI further? And the answer is yes, no, or not sure. And you should see it up there in front of you and you should be able to vote. And I understand um, that we're getting a fake result. This is very exciting. I've never done one of these. So we'll just give another 10, 15 seconds um, and then we will... Uh, 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. Time to vote. If you haven't voted, vote now, vote now, vote now, <laughs> or forever lose your vote. So 212 participants. Anybody was free to join this webinar. Oh, well, there we go. There's an overwhelming result there that close to 90%, 89% says we should explore UBI further with just 5% saying no, 6% not sure. So I'm going to um, uh, take that as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a request for us in some way to take this on. Um, I, I just want to, in wrapping this up, and, and you know, we'll, we'll send you an email in the next couple of days uh, asking you if you'd like to be part of a, another where we, in other words, we're going to get together, we're going to discuss how we might want to move this on. Uh, and you'll hear from us. Um, so I just want to wrap this up by saying, A, sorry it was so quick, uh, so rapid. Sorry we weren't able to deal with so many, as you can see, big and complex questions. Just enormous thanks to the panelists. Uh, Ruth, I'm sorry I never didn't have time to come back to you. You raised so many questions, we were all answering them. Uh, I'm enormously grateful to all the panelists uh, for their time. Very grateful to Brendan for hosting this uh, from Catholic Voices. Very grateful to all of you. And um, I look forward to what I'm sure will be a future webinar and events on this. We'll find a way of taking this forward. And thank you, Father Sean, for your contribution from Ireland. Thank you all. So my, my profound thanks to all the panelists, to, to Austin for, for sharing. Um, it's been a pleasure from the perspective of Catholic Voices to, to host this evening. Once this webinar has ended, um, you'll, you'll receive a link in your browser or on your phone um, for a sort of survey. Um, so this is just feedback on the survey, but it's also if you want more information, for example, um, the organization that Michael Pugh is, is, is representing, uh, this is called the Universal uh, Basic Income, so you can see here there's the website, so if you want to find out more information about that, there'll be um, a chance to, to, to get in for information, and we want to find out how you have experienced this webinar, um, and also to just let us know your thoughts and comments as Hopefully, as, 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 the, as the poll indicated, there's obviously a hunger and a thirst for, for, for talking about these issues. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, a last thanks to, to all of our panelists for all of the, the great contributions in the chat, the most lively chat I've ever been involved with in a webinar. Um, I want to uh, just uh, perhaps I can get a thumbs up from um, Bishop John Arnold if he's happy to lead us in, in a final prayer and kind of um, surprising with this. We're, get, we're getting the thumbs up. So I just want to say thank you from Catholic Voices, um, and we'll just end now with a, with a, with a final prayer from, from the bishop. And let's pray that the Spirit will guide us, that we may see the way ahead, so that all our brothers and sisters may be protected in their dignity, and that we may care for our common home, and that we may in some way make practical a vision for a just society in whatever way that may progress. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amazing. Thank you very much to, to everyone this evening for participating. We'll be in touch. There'll be an email tomorrow that will have a link to the survey if you haven't got a chance to, to do it now. Um, and also do get in contact with us to, to let us know how you want to, to progress with, with this. But from me, Brendan Thompson for Catholic Voices, I want to say thank you very much for, for joining this evening. Good night and God bless. <laughs>